Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Fandom Science Podcast. Today's episode is with Dr. Richard Bailey, and it's a really, really fun one. We talked about pseudoscience, what it means, what it looks like, and so many misconceptions in sports science that a lot of us believe. For example, the 10,000-hour rule, neurolinguistic programming, or the claim that we only use 10% of our brains, and so much more. We also talked about ways in which we can distinguish between pseudoscience or fake science and real scientific evidence so that when we're confronted with false claims, we don't fall for them easily. I really hope you enjoy this episode, and if you do, please like and subscribe to the channel. And if you really enjoyed it, share it with some other people who would also like it. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Yeah, you've, you've contributed a lot to the field of sport and exercise uh, science in many ways, and one of those is your work that you've done uh, to expose pseudoscience and neuromyths that are so mm. common in sports, uh, particularly yeah. among coaches and, and staff within sport organizations. Um, before we get into all of that stuff, and we will, uh, I just want to set the stage a little bit so everyone listening is on the same page throughout this episode. Uh, and I want to ask you, what does pseudoscience mean? Like, what is the definition of pseudoscience? Well, um, <clears throat> the literal definition of pseudoscience, or in German it would be um, pseudowissenschaft, um, is um, something that pretends to be science if in a nutshell. So um, pseudoscience in the classic definition, um, which is associated with Karl Popper, who I mentioned before, because he is, he is the person that invented this discussion, um, is the idea that certain practices or ideas um, or concepts are clothed in the language of science but they're not really. So it's not not science, that's really important. Like history, religion, philosophy are not science, but there's, no, that's not, there's nothing wrong with them. There's no criticism implicit within that. Pseudoscience is the idea that they are pretending to be science. So I'll give you an example, um, homeopathy, right? So do, I'll start outside and then give one from sport. Homeopathy is, is the method by which um, various different um, ingredients or chemi chemicals are watered down, watered down, watered down, watered down, um, to the point where the theory says um, they release some new potency for curing disease. Um, what actually happens is they have they lose the active ingredient There's, it's water so if you have a homeopathic in, uh, treatment you are drinking water if you take it as a tablet um, then you're um, taking sugar nothing else so um, homeopathy is, uses the language of, me of science because it talks about doctors medical doctors proper actual medical doctors some of them use it my health insurance in germany i can get um, um, homeopathy. If I go into a chemist, they have actual medicine and homeopathic medicine on the shelves. Um, they publish their, their research in their own internal journals, occasionally publish research in, norm, in mainstream journals and so on. Um, so in other words, it's wearing the clothes of science, but it fails to follow, should we say, the scientific attitude, the scientific approach. Um, one from sports science would be um, uh, the uh, uh, neurolinguistic programming, which is an enormously popular kind of self-help program um, that was invented in the United, United States in the 70s um, by two hippies, and it's developed to become a massive, great management tool, education tool. Uh, I actually spent two years, I've got the highest practitioner qualification you can get with one of the founders as part of a project to understand this thing um, and it has models of the brain it has charts graphs all sorts of things you can get a master's degree i imagine you can probably get a phd somewhere um, they publish the government commissions papers on this um, and it is bunkum it is um uh, there's bits in it that are quite useful. You know, you learn, you spend time talking to each other. You spend time observing each other. Well, who could argue? Who could argue? But for example, if I say to you now, um, just think about your holiday. And then I go, oh, now I can't help noticing your eyes moved up and to the left. That is accessing memory. Um, that's the pat eye pattern for memory. And what therefore from there on, if I were to build rapport for you, I will use on the one hand, 
visual language, if you can see what I mean, is that clear to you? I might change my physiology by raising my shoulders and slightly increasing the um, tone of my voice because that's the way visual, this is complete bullshit. There's no, no evidence to support any of this, but it uses the language of science and uses complicated words and occasionally publishes um, journal um, articles within their own um, in-house journals. So yeah, so pseudoscience is simply um, fake science. I suppose right. would be another word for it. And we're going to get into a lot of examples, especially in sports science, on on different neuromyths and different pseudoscientific ideas. Um, but just before that, you in one of your papers, you mentioned some characteristics that differentiate pseudoscience from real science. And I just want to go through just a couple of them and ask you yeah. to elaborate a bit on them. Yeah. Um, the first one, the first sign of pseudoscience you mentioned is unfalsifiability. Can well, you elaborate a bit on what that means? Yeah. Well, if you, if you remember, I said that Karl Popper kind of invented this question. And when he came up with a solution, his solution was unfalsifiability. One thing, just one thing. So he, he was... Um, uh, what's called an Austro-Marxist before the war. Uh, he was into Freud. Um, and he, he became disillusioned with them because they are pseudosciences in his mind. He said, you cannot criticise, you cannot falsify, prove wrong Freud, because the, they will then come back and say, what aspect of your history me, makes you behave like this? In other words, any criticism is bounced back to the criticizer. And the same thing happens with Marxism and Austrian Marxism. If you criticize it, what you're actually doing is expressing your latent um, social bias or class bias. So he came up with these ideas. The problem with that is um, falsifiability is very, very powerful, but it's very difficult to, to make it a criteria for pseudoscience because homeopathy is falsifiable therefore according to popper that would be a science i can prove homeopathy wrong clearly homeopathy is not a science i would suggest so it's not so falsifiability is the idea that you can prove something wrong and there's a an, um, an asymmetry there right so popper called it the um, black swan argument and then it, that's been taken up recently by that Talim, Ali Talim, um, writer. But, but essentially it's this, if I have a theory, let me have the theory that everyone at the University of Toronto, um, University of York, um, or York University, is it, um, is, uh, is a man, right? Is a man. So I go to York University and I walk around the campus and I see a man. So, oh, that's positive evidence in my favor. That increases the likelihood of that hypothesis being true. Uh, then I see another man. Oh, I've doubled my evidence that all men there. <laughs> I see another man. The reality is these individual um, observations add zero to um, the probability of my observational statement. Zero. Because unless my, my group that I'm observing, observing includes every single person in the world, it has a probability of zero. But if I see one woman, my theory dies. So observational um, information is asymmetrical, is unbalanced. Positive ev ev evidence adds either, if you believe Popper, literally nothing, or if you believe other people like Bayesian people, it adds a bit. Negative evidence kills theories. So falsi um, pseudoscientific theories are unfalsifiable because you can't kill them. Hmm. They, 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 this like the proof against... It's, yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll say, ah, well, you would say that, or um, you'll say, like, neurolinguistic programming, when I tried to uh, ask questions of that, I was told it's too difficult to come up with a test. Like, what? <laughs> Every other psychotherapy manages it. Or I could say, um, uh, they can, in other words, they can come up with ad hoc theories. So anything I ask of it, you can go, ah, uh, yeah, but what you didn't account for is... That isn't the way, for example, physics works. Right. Physics, I'll give you the opposite. Einstein predicted in 1919 that um, ob physical objects will affect not just other physical objects, so very big objects like the moon will affect smaller objects like um, satellite objects. We know that that's called gravity. Einstein said, and light. 
and light. Gravity affects light as well. Now, this had not been heard of at all. It was an extraordinary thing. So uh, um, Eddington, who was a British scientist, climbed to the top of Everest um, on a, um, a um, what's, it, what's it called, an eclipse, predicted where a straight line would, when the light comes round from the sun to the moon, where a straight line would hit. And then obviously any area closer to him, that would be a bend in the light because of gravity. And it did. Hmm. Einstein actually went more than, further than that. He didn't just say light will bend because of gravity. He said, and if my theory is proved wrong, my theory is wrong. That's falsifiability. Yeah. He, he left himself and his theory open for falsifiability. Like Absolutely. It, it's true yeah. until it's proven wrong. And then when it's wrong, it's just wrong. And I was wrong. No, you wouldn't, apart from the bit at the beginning, it's not true. Right. Um, we will, we will, let's, let's just humor, or let's just hold that idea hmm. until it's proved wrong. Truth right. is, is kind of a different thing, isn't it? But, but if I say, you know, I've got some great theory. Uh, oh, I mean, there's a really good example of that. Unfortunately, for me, I was part of a group that um, carried out a very comprehensive review of the relationship between physical activity and um, uh, education achievement. Um, and a year before, I published quite a large paper in which I argued that the evidence was pretty much cut and dried. You know, physical activity improves education achievement. And then we did a very, very large review and analysis um, multinational analysis with quality measures. That was the big difference. And bugger me, it looks like I'm wrong. Um, or at the very least, I shouldn't have said it because, um, you know, these things are complicated, but um, our evidence for the big review does not support the idea that physical activity has a significant effect upon education achievement. Well, that's therefore my theory was falsifiable and in fact at that level it was falsified and now mm. every time i talk about that subject um, i have to revise my position in light of the new evidence right right so that's that's one one characteristic on falsifiability the, the other one is uh pseudoscience has an emphasis on confirmation rather than the refutation and i think that's kind of um alludes to what we were saying it's basically yeah, you look, you Positive information, um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and and any fool can find positive information for any theory. Anybody, come up and say talent development. Come up with a theory of, of talent development, no matter how crazy and unethical, and you will find something that supports that theory. That that's not that's not the way science um, science works. Um, you've got to look for negative um, negative evidence. You've got to to say, you know, well, what would it have to be like for me to be wrong? You know, what, mm -hmm. what would I have, would it be, there's a great example of that, you know, that during the um, coronavirus, I've seen dozens of times a video of an angry American woman called Jane Elliott um, talking about race. And you, you might have seen it yourself where she gets a group of children and she puts collars on all the blonde children. And uh, she treats them like blacks were treated in the Southern states in the past to give them an insight into what racism feels like. Um, I did it when I was training to be a teacher. Thousands and th millions of people have done this training. Um, and everyone, I was convinced this is marvellous. Uh, you know, and they, they use the, the absolute classic pseudoscience confirmation. What do you think? Mm. So if, you, if I do something novel, the likelihood of you giving a positive um, reply is vastly greater than if you're doing something you've always done. So novelty increases positive responses. If, if the person that did the intervention asks you, that increases the positive um, responses as well. So what they do is exactly that. They kind of go, how do you feel? You know, talk about your feelings and all this. Whatever you do, don't go home and think about it. Do it now before you can reflect. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we all thought it was fabulous. And uh, $6 million later, investing in her program independent evaluators found it either had no effect at all or made people a bit more racist wow but the problem is if you go out looking for positive evidence you'll you'll find it and as i said if you know if i get 100 people to tell me that that program is successful 
the probability of that within the theory is zero, is zero, is, has no effect on the probability at all. It's the negative evidence that has the effect. Right. Corroboration is um, much too used in sports science. PhDs talk about proving theories and all this type of thing. We should stay away from such language because it's, it, dragons are that way, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And dragons talk about, being, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, it's, it's you know, in old maps with pirates where they didn't know there'd be a big sign that went dragons be here. You know, just stay away. Stay away from proving, confirming, all that, because essentially you're lying to yourself. You're, you're lying to console your psychology because we all like to be right. Right. And uh, talk about correcting yourself and, and we all like to be right. I was just wrong two minutes ago and I said, I just realized that how wrong I was when I said I, Einstein thought this is my theory, it's true until you prove it wrong, when in reality, the basis of scientific methods, especially in statistics, the way we do it is, if we think something is true, and we mm. think there is an effect out there, then the statistical way to approach it is to say, this is wrong until the data tells me otherwise. Exactly. Um, yeah, and that's yeah, the, exactly. yeah. But I also think, considering the type of work that we both do, you know, I consider it a branch, sports science branch of human science, and i um, albeit an underrated human science. People don't quite get how important sport is, but it's human science. Um, I think what you've just said there is, is there's a moral aspect to that as well. You know, stop messing about with people's lives. Just read, read journals where people are doing these, the most intrusive investigations um, on often on some kind of feeling they know, oh, when you talk to them, oh, I just knew that it would be right. Stop it. It's dangerous. You know, with early specialization in sport, um, you know, despite the fact that more and more evidence sh is showing that it's, um, it's potentially harmful and more importantly, perhaps unnecessary. Nobody asks questions like, should we be doing this with five-year-olds in the first place? It seems very easy answer, very easy. No, no, you shouldn't. You know, in my view, I wrote um, Advice Sport England. My view is 10 years of age is the minimum. Um, and that's based on evidence of the perception of the ability to see the consequences of our actions. Um, but of course, what people do is they look, talk about early specialization, invariably talk about Tiger Woods, that is proof. No, it isn't. Right. It really isn't. Look at the pattern of findings. It does not support that. The only reason they use that confirmation approach is because that's the only way to maintain their argument. And Tiger Woods is one out of 100 yeah. million people. He's a freak. He's a freak. Exactly. Yeah. So, so getting to the meat of this topic, uh, you ran a study in 2018 where you looked at the prevalence of neuromyths and pseudoscientific yeah. beliefs among over 500 coaches. From different sports. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a thousand, but oh, it was a thousand because of my um, uncompleted responses. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. So it was about seven hundred or something, wasn't it? I, I mean, st still, yeah, very impressive. Um, and you found that coaches agreed with forty-one percent of mm. statements that were actually pseudoscientific and are actually false. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what are the commonly believed myths that you found uh, among coaches and people in sport organizations? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're following on now from that study. The COVID thing obviously interfered with it, but uh, we're going to be doing a study in Canada, um, I hope. We've got two studies currently in Germany. One in Sweden is finished. There'll be one in Netherlands uh, to try and pursue this. But there have been a few studies over the years, uh, basically in schools, and we've, I have continued it, but focusing on coaching. Um, but there's an overlap. That's why I mentioned that, because teacher training and coach education and sports science education actually all of the sports disciplines just copy what education does and then just adapts it so the fact for example that 94 percent of dutch teachers believe that we process or have a preference for processing visual auditory or kinesthetically is is terrifying because we don't um 90% Dutch teachers, 94% uh, Dutch teachers, 90% of British teachers. In our survey, it was 70% of coaches in the UK and Ireland 
um, believed that when you're processing information, you have a preferred learning style. So I prefer to learn through reading. I prefer to learn through listening. I prefer to learn through doing things. That's learning styles, and uh, it has repeatedly been shown not to be true. Um, it's there's nothing we know about the brain supports that way of thinking. Um, if there is a preferred style, it's visual because ninety percent of the <laughs> neocortex is concerned with vision. So we're all visual thinkers. Let's say that then. But the problem problem is intuitively it seems right lots and lots of people have been told this and therefore they frame their expectations go, oh well i like to learn by listening i like but the reality is once you start scratching beneath the surface we find well what a surprise you know i'm a visual learner when i'm reading i'm an auditory learner when i'm listening to the radio and i'm a kinesthetic learner in the bath or something like that it's it's kind of intuitively right but it isn't. And the good thing about that is, you know, you and your listeners would be e fairly easily able to create a simple experiment to test it, some type of blind trial, some assessment, find out what the questionnaires say is their preferred learning style. Don't tell them, don't tell the teachers, randomly distribute them. And of course, there should be a weighting towards those who have the preferred. And of course, there isn't. So learning styles is by far the most common, very popular. It's um, Professor Dave Collins in the UK and I uh, created this phrase scienciness, which is another phrase for pseudoscience. You know, it seems scientific because it refers to the brain. It refers to learning. Um, but it's, it's um, pseudoscience. And um, it's a dangerous, my view is it's a dangerous pseudoscience. If I tell you you're a visual thinker, uh, what effect would that have on your learning and your life? It will either have no effect or it will damage you because you'll, you'll potentially stay away from auditory or kinesthetic um, inputs. Um, so I think it's rather poisonous and uh, rather stupid. And it's terrifying that um, the reason so many people believe in learning styles was because they were taught it by their national governing bodies. Not some random company offering um, some nonsense psychology. You have to believe in this, or at least say you believe in it, to become a cricket coach or a rugby coach or a Canadian football coach or whatever it is. It's in the curriculum. And that's really shocking. That means if you want to become a, I don't know, whatever, a coach in a certain sport, you have to pay them money to teach you something that is not true. That's, that's for me, is a real um, ethical problem. The idea that you cannot coach in Germany, for example, you cannot coach without coaching qualification and you cannot get your coaching qualification unless you meet certain standards. If one of those standards is you believe a stupid idea like learning styles, I, that's kind of fraud, I would have thought. So, yeah, so learning styles, very, very common. Um, so how, and, how did learning styles make its way into the 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 organizing bodies and the curriculum to begin yeah. with. Well, like, I think where did that, that come from? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to look at at the moment, actually, how it happened. Um, it came in initially through, through there were models of learning styles, um, not like um, the sensory ones, but like ref, some of us are reflection people, some of us are action people, that type of learning style. And that has some support in the literature. So the concept of specialism squeezed in, uh, management um, management people embraced it as well uh, because what it offered was something a bit um, scientific, a science that could offer, offer them something new. Um, and um, and there's a there's a concept in um, biology called, I'm trying to remember what it's called, di dimorphic mind. The dimorphic mind is the idea that we're all predisposed to divide the world up, right? So them and us, the them and us bias in neuroscience is an example of that. But, you know, um, there's cats and dogs, there's men and women, there, you know, types and types and types of people. And, it, and learning styles fits in with that way of thinking. You know, there are three types of people, auditory, kinesthetic, and visual, but it's very attractive. And if particularly, I give you another thing I could say, and you know what? If you've had problems in life or in school, it's probably 
not your fault. It's the way you were taught. That's a very appealing idea. So yeah, it was really um, uh, very, very promising. Then the UK government commissioned the biggest review of learning styles uh, about 1990 something. That review concluded, this is nonsense. We shouldn't be doing it. No effect at all, just carried on. People just ignored it. Um, and as coaching qualifications happen more and more, um, people are looking to fill their programs with su stuff that seems scientific. And um, anything, research shows, anything that talks about the brain significantly increases its believability to the reader. Um, so yeah, it's, it kind of hits all the stops in terms of marketing of ideas. Yeah. It's and simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, go ahead. I was saying it's simple, it's attractive, it plays up to my attributional disposition that says, it's not my fault, it's the schools, it's my parents, it's society, mm -hmm. very attractive. And we're going to get to the, the susceptibility to pseudoscience and the, the general knowledge of the brain in a second, but uh, just want to talk a little bit more about the other neural myths that you found yeah. uh, in sport organizations. The other one was that we only use 10% of our brains. And I posted a clip of, on Instagram of, of you discussing that um, just to, to, to promote the episode before it. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I saw that film, Lucy. I, I, I don't know if you've seen it. It was quite, I mean, it was quite good. It's got Scarlett Johansson in, hasn't it? So it's, it's, it's always going to be okay. Um, but it's premised on the idea that we all use something like, ten, they say, 10 or 20% of our brain. And if only it were possible to use more. I refer you to my points about attribution effects earlier on. You know, if only it'd be possible. It's not my fault. I, I just don't use all, all of my capacity. Uh, we all use 100% of our brains almost all the time. Uh, if, if we use 10% of our brain, there is a technical term for that in psychology, which is dead, um, because uh, brain death, which is when doctors turn off the switch, is 25% brain activity. So 10% of the brain is well below death. Um, yeah, we use brain all the time, even when you're sleeping. Um, but the psychology of it is really, really interesting. Because I think I spoke to a lot of people about this and they find the idea of 10% use empowering because it's about oh, how much more potential I've got. And I, I kind of get that, but it's just not true. It's not true. Um, and um, I do wonder about what effect it can have on somebody who believes they have this almost infinite capacity for growth. What happens if they're disappointed? You know, what happens if it doesn't happen? Um, because actually, factually, we do not use 10% of our brain. Uh, evolution would tell us simply enough, we would not, the brain is the most costly part of, of, of the human system, right? The human phenotype. It takes up an enormous percentage of our calorific intake. Uh, it's, it's vulnerable to damage. There must be a reason the human brain has, it, has developed the way it is. And then to say, and then let's just use 10% of that phenomenally expensive um, uh, vehicle for, for learning and things. It just wouldn't happen. Um, so yeah, ten percent is is lots of people. People would say it to me as if it's a fact. You know, let me just tell you. Um, and uh, I was I was told that recently by a religious person who told me that God was the other ninety percent. What she was trying to do was fill up her brain with God. Um, you know, well, okay, whatever you want. That 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 one has got to be the ten percent. That one's got to be one of the most popular notions about the brain or popular neuro myths about the brain or anything ever, because I've been hearing about that since I was a kid. That's right. I mean, I, th I believe it goes back to about 1960s when a journalist made it up in an article. A lot of these things are invented by journalists, either looking for a story or um, looking for kind of, journalists and writers uh, are always looking for a punchy way of doing things. So the 10% of the brain, I believe, was um, a journalist made it as kind of a metaphor and then it just got, there's other, other myths, not necessarily neuro myths, that have a similar origin. Uh, you may have heard um, eight, drink eight pints of water a day. That was another myth just invented by a journalist, you know? And then very recently within our own, our own area, um, one writer invented the myth 10,000 hours, of course. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, yeah. 
Gladwell plucked it out of his ass, didn't he? Because that's not related to anything that I've ever heard, heard of in the literature. Mm -hmm. but the reason is he sells books. Ericsson and, you know, Baker and Cote and these other people, they have a different job, which is to do with truth and clarity and so on. He sells books. So he can't say, well, it's complicated uh, because all the different factors and, you know, the, um, the, the, you look at these different... He can't say that. He has to say... The mad he uses the phrase, isn't he? The magic number. Um, there is no magic number. I think could you could you tell us a little bit more about why the ten thousand hour rule is as complete bullshit? Because yeah. I think it's it's very prevalent in, in sports and actually in all domains. Yeah. Well that's gonna be included in our future studies, actually, the ten thousand hours. <clears throat> because if you go around, for example, soccer clubs, hockey clubs, basketball clubs, they now have programs designed to achieve 10,000 hour hours of practice from their players. So that's 10, uh, 10 years, three hours a day, or five years, six hours a day, and, and so on. Uh, it originated, in fact, very close to where I am sitting now in Berlin, at the Berlin Conservatoire, where um, they were looking, Ericsson looked at um, violinists, very prestigious academy. And um, basically, what's the difference between good and really good violinists and he said something like it works out as an average of 10,000 hours deliberate practice and I always think the key phrase is deliberate practice not the 10,000 hours because deliberate practice is hard practice with feedback and effort not just going through the process more you know it's an average and then since then he's carried out various other studies that kind of show you know more or less it's about 10,000 hours and then I, I know there have been a number of studies Starks and people like that have done studies in Canada that show well you know, look, oh look it's kind of about 10,000 hours um, let's take this as a Popperian question in other words try and falsify it uh, are there any studies or any examples of somebody becoming an elite athlete not with 10,000 hours and of course millions of examples one member of the german football team of the um, the time before last world cup probably about 2000 hours um, from a, a sampling background um, myself uh, martin toms and matt B uh, bridge at birmingham did a study of elite golfers we work it out between 20 and 30000 hours for elite golf um, the skeleton at the winter olympics um, the uh, studies of australia and then the and the uk teams that won the golds probably 1800 hours so that's not a magic number as an average i think that's interesting as a metaphor i think it's more interesting you don't want to be a champion you've got to put 10,000 hours in um but as a magic number it's it's not true and the other point is it's it's, it's not the number it's the quality of the practice so um the most famous test of this was a golfer um called matt Dan McLaughlin, who um, decided, he said, oh, I've never played sport before. I'm going to become a pro with 10,000 hours. He had, we've learned he had played sport before. Uh, and he practiced for 10,000 hours. That is not deliberate practice. Going on a golf course for 10,000 hours is not deliberate practice. He said, one phrase was, I occasionally consulted a pro. Deliberate practice would require the pro going around the course with you, checking, testing, feedback, all this type of thing. And it would involve an element of intensity that seems to be missing as well. So 10,000 hours is very attractive for similar reasons to some of the other myths. It gives the possibility that you can do this. You know, if you haven't done it in the past, it's not your fault. But if you use this secret source, then you could do this. So lots of these things, learning styles, 10%, 10,000 hours, they're unified by this idea of human potential. Um, and I think that's probably a, a great thing. But I also think there's a fine line between uh, inspiring and motivating people and um, wasting their time and misleading them. And those on the other side. I think there's there's nothing more powerful than the idea of selling potential and hope to people yeah. and when you when you when you instill um that kind of false sense of of ambition i guess you could call it and people and say like you can achieve anything you want if you if you put your mind to it or if you put the time in or if you yeah. i mean i if i work if, if i work for like 30 years i'll never be in the nba 
Yeah. So yeah. why how, how come that's such a like an easy and, and conceivable idea but otherwise yeah. when you tell people you can do anything you want it's just so easy to sell. I totally agree. I had a research student or an applicant for a, a studentship who said um in the interview something like I believe I can do anything I want. So I said what you mean like literally anything you know, literally anything and i said right jump out the window and fly and i'll give you a job <laughs> um and this is the point if you read some of the literature you know that what i would say is the most poisonous hateful book ever written is um the secret the law of attraction the idea that if you imagine all these positive things then you achieve these positive outcomes poisonous for two reasons one that's obviously not true but secondly what happens if your life is is fairly bad that's your fault then isn't it the whole thing about the human potential movement and i spent years years traveling through this movement as a young man i ultimately came to the conclusion that it's hyper individualistic hyper um uh, hyper responsibilistic and says it's all up to me i can't so for example genetics is irrelevant you know if you read that whole cluster of books about 10 years ago on talent making no mention of genetics uh well all of a sudden apparently elite sport is the only thing in human development that isn't affected by genetics if you read that because literally everything else in human development is genetically influenced in some way or another literally my eye color is obviously genetically influenced but also my intelligence my accent all of these things are so apparently though no it's all practice it's all talent that i think that becomes dangerous because you're you're setting up a lot of people for disappointment and they only have themselves to blame that's then the mindset of the inherent within the model it must be me i'm not doing it right it's a dangerous well, game yeah and it's a religious game because you you know when you have other people that pray for certain things this is within the bible right if you pray for certain things and they don't happy happen you don't blame god you blame yourself i didn't do it right i'm a bad person it's exactly the same again and the new age movement of the of the 60s and 70s was exactly the same shifting responsibility completely onto the individual apart from the guru who can give you the secrets and if you don't doesn't go right your fault right yeah uh, oh yeah it's a it's a it's a double edged sword sometimes it can comfort you to 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 think about the ideas of potential and say uh, hey it's not my fault uh, you know it's things outside of my control and that can bring you comfort that can bring you false sense of of uh, ambition and then yeah. when you when it all comes down crashing and you realize that hey it's all on you then it can be devastating as well yeah but i think and you're absolutely right and i think it's a very difficult uh bridge to cross mm -hmm. but the one thing that we can do is make sure that our scientific or empirical claims are valid uh, and that's where a lot of these neuro myths fall down because uh, they they i think you could say if you do i'm trying to think of an example like, if you train in boxing for 10 years you might be an olympic champion fair enough because you know that you have to train if you do this pro, um, if you follow this product or do this course you will become an olympic champion that's a different um, myth because that's premised on the um effectiveness of the product and that's where it becomes a little bit poisonous you know there is no magic number 10000 there is no there are no learning styles we do not use 10% of our brain we obviously do have a left and a right brain but not the way these awful awful books talk about them you know as if we've got kind of two types of intelligence no we have we have one brain connected so um yeah so the thing is there it's it, there's the the fortune telling aspect which is always going to be difficult um but it, it's never going to be helped by um pushing um all this nonsense right so what caught my eye the most from your work and other work too is um uh, you've mentioned that the more knowledge about the brain and neuroscience that a coach has or just a person has the more likely they are to be susceptible to neuromyths and pseudoscience and yeah. i think the same was found in teachers too yeah. 
Um, and this this surprised me because it kind of goes against what you would normally think. So could you tell us why that is the case? Um, no, no. <laughs> no, we don't know. <laughs> but I can guess. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's a real anomaly, isn't it? You say so. The real, the obvious solution to neuromyths is to teach people about the brain. That makes them more susceptible. Do you know the phrase um, "a little knowledge is a dangerous thing"? I think that's the phenomenon. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. You study something just enough to kind of get a bit of a sense of it, um, but not enough to understand it. Um, and then you become more vulnerable to those, um, those myths. I tell you what I think happens, it's this, um, there's people develop a small amount of knowledge um, for the reasons I've just said, but not enough to differentiate between science and pseudoscience. Therefore, they do not they learn the content of the programs without understanding the science the conceptual framework of the science so for me the answer has to be any scientific exercise like sports science has to include discussions of the nature of science the nature of evidence yet we talked about proof criticism testability and falsifiability if not you're simply giving people a vocabulary or bits of knowledge that could be used positively or negatively. So I, th I think um, the, um, the literature at the moment is not clear, but my reading of it, um, as far as I can tell, is that um, if you want to educate somebody to be uh, a, a sensible user, you can either educate them really fully to degree or above level, or give them the knowledge that needs to be taught plus prepare them for making judgments about um, evidence and uh, falsifiability and, and so on. Um, I think that's the way ahead. Um, but it does make me wonder, it makes me wonder about other things as well. You know, other aspects of our sports science where we do a short course on something. Where, the, like, I mean, I'll give you a concrete example. If you want to become a coach in most countries, you have to study first aid. That seems obviously a good thing. Has anyone ever studied how many people have died because of the misapplication of, of first aid? Because if you do like a three hour course, you're like a ticking time bomb for, uh, for somebody who's ill, I would have thought. It, you, know, you know what I mean? You've got that little bit of information. Or if you're a phys ed teacher and you have a short introduction to teaching gymnastics, is that safe? <laughs> I'm not completely sure it is. I, you know, I'd, I'd rather, I think, I think there's a question about whether you'd rather do nothing. Right. Um, one, I know you're into philosophy. Uh, so I got this little nugget here for you oh. trying to, I was, I was just reading the book, uh, thinking fast and slow by Daniel Kahneman the other day. Yeah. And, um, I hope that's not pseudoscience either. Uh, no, 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 no. Seems it's, like a solid a one. Debate there, if you want me to talk about that later on, there is a debate about Kahneman, <laughs> but uh, it's not pseudoscience. No. Oh I'm, yeah. We'll get into that debate all day. Um, so he, he referenced in his book a 17th century philosopher, um, not sure how to pronounce his first name, Barak Spinoza, I think. Yep. And who, he, he said that understanding a statement must begin with an attempt to believe it. You must first know what the idea would mean if it were true. Mm -hmm. Only then you can decide whether or not to unbelieve it. And so this got me thinking about the relationship between general knowledge about the brain and susceptibility to pseudoscience is that maybe it comes from an openness to learning and yeah. and and uh, kind of like a hunger to learn and saying okay this idea sounds interesting let me let me act as if it were true and so i can understand it but then these the people the coaches or whoever else maybe does not have um it, like enough depth of scientific methods to go further and then unbelieve that idea yeah could be. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, Spinoza was one of the, um, there's two basic traditions of epistemology, the theory of knowledge, rationalists and empiricists. Uh, rationalists were primarily continental Europeans like Spinoza um, or Leibniz or uh, Descartes, René Descartes. Um, and empiricists were primarily British, uh, John Locke, David Hume, um, people like that. The empiricists won the day. I should, it's fairly obvious they won the day because they became scientists. 
science came from empiricist epistemology. And so the rationalists, the empiricists start, started with the premise of um, discrete ideas. So you start with an idea and then you build on that idea. Right? That's, that's uh, rationalism or intellectualism is sometimes called. Uh, the uh, empiricists start from the idea that you don't have an idea, you observe, and then you gradually build up your idea. So rationalists start with reason, empiricists start with observation. I think most people would say that both of them are wrong, um, but some blend of them would be right. So um, if you take Spinoza's idea, the idea of um, under believing before you understand is kind of counterintuitive, but but it could be what you said, you know, about the idea of actually kind of coming to terms with the idea. If that's what he means, that seems very sensible. That seems very sensible. That isn't what he means. Um, what he, you, you, I think you've said it more, more sensibly than he has. What he really means is that you, that you begin with the nugget of an idea you know to be absolutely true. So fam the most famous rationalist, Descartes, said, uh, Cogit, Cogito ergo sum, I know therefore I am, right? That's the one thing I know for certain. And from that, he attempted to build up knowledge. Um, the empiricists would say, we don't know anything, this will be a myth. Uh, it seems to me that you need to bring them together. So the idea of following through ideas and testing them, uh, this is kind of a cycle. I've got this idea. If I believe an idea at the beginning, the first thing, to some extent, I have to understand it to believe it in the first place. That's kind of a logical corollary, I would say. But once I'm there, if I'm honest, if I'm a truth seeker, I'm going to start testing it right from day one. And then once I, but I can only test something I genuinely understand. And it's, it's kind of this repeated cycle idea, or sometimes called critical rationalism. So you're testing, critical is the testing, rationalism is the ideas. This cycle of testing, throw idea up, test it, throw idea up, test it. That's exactly what pseudoscience doesn't do. Exactly what they don't do. They don't put ideas up for testing. They hide them, they shield them, they avoid them, all sorts of things. But good science, like Einstein did, threw his idea up and then went, knock it down. Um, and the fact that it survived doesn't make it true. It makes it survivable for now. It's not right, it's not wrong, but we've got it for now, because we now know some of the Einstein stuff was, was wrong. Um, yeah. Newton, Isaac Newton, the most corroborated scientist in history, was fundamentally wrong about lots of things, but he put it out there, you know? Yeah. So speaking about that, science, most of the time, science is, is not really catchy or attractive. It's actually kind of most of the time it's kind of dense and complex, uh, yeah. especially something like neuroscience or physics, or it's right. not inherently that um, like simple or attractive, I would say. Maybe yeah. to some people, maybe to some people, but not, but not, not to everyone, uh, especially not people outside of science. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it comes and goes. I like to think that I have a certain geek chic, um, you know, that there's, you can kind of communicate. And scientific, the, the scientific communicators have done an amazing job. We don't really have anyone like that in sport, I don't think. Um, but if you look at physics, uh, biology, evolution, and so on, there are some really, really effective um, communicators. Um, and the other Steven problem Pinker, we've got is not, for example. Well, yeah, I'm still thinking now is in in a lot of hot water, isn't he, um, with uh, his professional association. When he goes back, do you see this with Pinker? No, I, I didn't. What happened? Oh. To him? Well, he, uh, you know, he's, I, I I disagree with most of what he says, but I I rate him as an intellectual, and he's a very very good writer. But you know, he's my understanding is he's a progressive, but he's he doesn't play this politically correct game. So he's made a few comments and uh, nothing even resembling, I think, racism. The, uh, the Linguistics Association has 150 members has demanded that he uh, be removed or there's some punishment against him. And the examples they give are the most pathetic, pathetic examples. This is 150 people. So it's you know, quite a large number. And, and, and it's basically, he's not, playing by the rules of the gang it's really have a, have a new york times as a feature on it it's really offensive 
I think, um, that anyone would do that. Um, but it's, um, you know, I don't know. I think it really is worrying. Um, I, dig I digress. Um, what are we talking about? Yeah, it's the, the different oh, communicators across the communicators. And we need that. And I think we're very poor, particularly as our community is that we serve is primarily teachers and coaches and people like that. Um, and we do a very bad job of communicating this this to them. Uh, and the 10,000 hours rule or whatever is a good example. That I don't think any proper sports scientist advocated that, yet went straight in, straight in to, to the coaching environment, to the fields, because it's catching, all that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think... I think when we've not been good, if you look at journals, um, they don't communicate, I mean, for a start, they're badly written articles, um, badly written, badly communicated. Um, they're not written for a, an audience of coaches. I think we're in a situation now where every applied field like sports science or sports psychology, the journals in those areas should have sections or this is what it means for the coach this is what it means for the organization there should be people should be as a matter of course forced to communicate with this with the community um and um, but we're not we're not good at it and neuroscience is not good at it but un unlike neuroscience sports science has fairly clearly defined population that we serve and i don't think most of them um would 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 work with academia I, I occasionally talk in canada on uh, coaching conferences okay um and have i ever seen a canadian professor at one of these i'm not sure i ever have and it could be reverse snobbery or it could be that they're so scared of you know we're not going to understand anything he says um or, or there's no connection none of these are justified you know they're your community. There's no shortage of them here. There's no shortage of them, and they're very good. Canada is, you know, right at the top for um, sports science. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm always surprised. I mean, it's not just Canada, it's all over the place. Right. But uh, Canada struck me as an interesting example because, as you say, there are no shortage of people with a lot of knowledge. Um, so I, you know, it's, well, I think we have to hold our hands up and say we haven't done a good job. Yeah, I would, I would say, don't you think scientists are not as good as at marketing themselves yeah. as the pseudo scientists? Yeah, that's one of the signs of pseudo. One of the signs of pseudoscience mm -hmm. is that pseudo scientists are very good at uh, marketing and public relations promotion. You know, if you look at some of the books on, um, you know, for, for my for the paper in Frontiers in Psychology. I looked at some of the research on um, marketing um, and you say, well, keep it simple, keep it brief, uh, keep it very clear, keep it persuasive, keep it, um, I mean, it's called success, isn't it? So, uh, but it's sort of short, um, unlikely, oh, that's interesting, um, clear, concise, um, and, and, and so on. I was lucky, I've, I've been working with Nike a lot and I've learned a lot about um, marketing. Um, and I don't know if you've seen it, but if not, have a look at um, Design to Move, for which I was the um, lead scientist. That, I think, is the near... That's the, the, the one time in my career where I think I communicated sports science really well. And that's because I had a paid journalist to work with me um, and... and huge huge budget of designers and things um, but when i look at the design to move literature i think we got it right i really do or or writer than i've had before or since yeah and so why do you think that we're in science people just don't don't focus on marketing i i find it so ironic that in science we spend hours and hours and years working on on publications and it's like it's like the ultimate goal is like get a publication publish this and publish that only for that publication to be put out in a journal where other people in your field are going to read it who yeah. who aren't necessarily the always the people who need to, to read it like these people yeah. are they know that stuff 
Yeah, it's changing a bit, isn't it, with the open access? Uh, I put all of my publications on uh, ResearchGate, which is in Berlin, and um, Academia Edu for free. I, I run the uh, Coaching Science Facebook group. Um, any publications that uh, come either by me or anyone can be put, are housed in the file section there for that reason, to try and make it as accessible. Uh, also, I mean, I do quite a lot of journalism as well. Um, and uh, for Nike and other people. Um, and it's a skill. And if you don't learn it, like anything else, it's a skill. Um, I think public speaking is a skill. I think writing is a skill and marketing is skills. And I don't know about your courses or your place, but um, I've never come across a place that teaches any of them. Um, they're actually incredibly powerful job job markets. You know, if you, if I, again, I don't know the Canadian, um, well, it's true in Canada, but in many countries of the world, if you write a, like a best-selling book or you produce something and you market it and you can get television time, you will get a job at a university, you will get that job because the universities are desperate for um, PR, just desperate for it. Um, I was quite lucky that I, I did a series of products, a series of work on, um, on products um, that gave the illusion that I was more of a television celebrity than I really was. Um, and it just, uh, you know, the, uh, um, I mean, I'll, give, I'll just give you one example as kind of a slight, slight break. I did. Um, uh, one program for one th um, series of activities for one washing powder, shall we say? And um, the marketing company were obviously brilliant because they they had me on all through the day and every night on on BBC and uh, independent things. And then I did um, six o'clock in the morning on the equivalent of Fox, uh, and then and then I I did an int another interview, and then I came in at nine o'clock in the morning to teach. And I was teaching teachers, not so they were already teachers coming into the university. And I did this course, and I had kind of had this air that I was a bit of a big deal, right? Because you know, I, I was now friends with the You're famous on BBC. Uh, I mean, come on, yeah, 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 no. And I so I came in and I did that, and I did, and I was waiting for somebody to kind of say something a bit fawning. Oh, you're amazing! But PE teachers just sat there, right? They don't. And the end of it, I said, so any questions? And this one old grey kind of gnarly teacher said, are you wearing makeup? And I hadn't <laughs> put the makeup on. And that was the one question I asked. But the reality was, um, it, the reality was what I learned from that was that our job as, a, as an academic, a professor or whatever, it, is inseparable from the communicating what we're doing. And, and the more I did it, the more I became convinced by it, which was we are primarily paid from the public purse. It is the height of arrogance to think we do not have a duty to the community. It's, I mean, it's extraordinarily arrogant. Now, there are some people who don't have the skills and we might not want to talk to the public. That's fine. But... It must be so. Journals, I've already said, I think fail in communicating to the to the public. But so, what about things like you know, you do projects, you do development. What about public lectures? What about we've learned through the COVID um, outbreak, the idea of online programs? What about what you're doing now, communicating with people? I just think if we're not communicating, if we're not doing you know marketing, as you say, what? Why are they paying us? I don't get it. If you're a theoretical physicist, I get it. I get it. Doesn't need to be practical. Sports science is practical. It's just by the nature of the beast. So, uh, yeah. So I, yeah. I don't really, really get it. I think we've just gotten so focused on um, because in, in academia and in science, there's this huge like publish or perish kind of mentality, um, and it's not just the mentality. I mean, it's the truth. If if you don't publish yes. enough, you it is Toast. yeah and it really changed i mean many of my phd students i mean i'm lucky i don't particularly I, I do publish still um but out of interest um or to support people many of my phd students are making these judgments or you know it's not going to be the most appropriate journal now it's the journal with the biggest impact factor um i you know i mentioned right er, earlier on about Wittgenstein, most influential philosopher of the 20th century one book he wrote during his lifetime 
So he wouldn't even get a job at some minor community college because he's only written one book. That isn't how, how these things work. What about doing it properly? So you get you get also this grade inflation where relatively pointless articles are being submitted to, to keep up your impact factor. And then they're submitted to relatively low grade journals. But the journals have to have their grade inflation so that people submit to them. It's kind of, a, it's, you know, it's a conspiracy of, uh, um, well, no, the emperor's got no clothes. Everyone buys into this lie. Um, and it's, it's, it's all for some spurious international competition, I think. Um, yeah, and, and the other problem with it is not just that, um, you know, people are publishing, publish or die and all this type of thing. Um, they're publishing in increasingly narrow fields because whilst people like yourself are being told to that interdisciplinary research is wonderful and how marvelous, and in fact, sports science is an inherently interdisciplinary field, um, it is completely clear from the evidence that interdisciplinary researchers get less money, have lower impact factors, and uh, have less prestige. So we're not even rewarding people that do the job that we're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, if you if you choose a topic and only do that topic for the rest of your career, not only will it be incredibly boring, but it will also be probably quite successful. Whereas if you go searching for all the really interesting um, examples of projects, then you'll have a really lovely time, probably won't get promoted as um, as quickly as the boring people, you know? There and there's, is, yeah. of course. There's so many things going on that, that need fixing that we can spend all yeah. day on. Um, so just bringing it back before we wrap up to, to pseudoscience and the neural mess again, um, do you think that in the, in the modern age that we're living in now where people have so much access to information, more so than ever before, um, do you think that the internet and all of that has promoted a culture of embracing good quality evidence or bullshit? Because both are abundantly available on the yeah. internet this day and age, and you can find both. So Yeah, that's right. if you know where to look. I mean, the, the, the key, key distinction is knowing how to tell the difference. Um, and a lot of the discussions I've had with people on, on the internet about COVID-19 are, are characterized by the fact that they do not know how to tell the difference between good and bad sources. So we're actually starting a project quite soon. Well, we've started it, but I'll be doing this part of the activity quite soon, where um, I'm going to develop a guide for making the most of the internet to try to, to try to work with people relatively low educational backgrounds about try you know, just kind of an instructional guide, but that's, don't take everything on face value. Because it's democracy, isn't it? You know, this is democratized learning and democracy is good and bad. You know, that uh, Winston Churchill said, um, democracy is the worst form of government ever with the exception of all the other ones. Um, and I kind of think that about this as well. You know, I think clearly the internet, Facebook, YouTube, um, has created a, pro a problem and as you quite rightly say um, with it has come free access to lots and lots of information that's of high quality what's the alternative the alternative is what happened before whereas where everything was behind a paywall where only people within the academy were able to ex um, access it um, and therefore they felt no need to communicate it with anywhere else. I think the secret is to celebrate the democratization of knowledge, but to educate people rather like I said before about science. If you want people to be careful and, and stay away from pseudoscience, you have to teach them how to do that. You have to teach them what good science is and bad science, what evidence is, what probability is, what, whatever. And, and likewise with this, you've got to, we've got to teach people how to access information because your students, like my students, whether we want it or not, will be searching the internet for projects and things like that. They've got to be supported or their learning has got to be scaffolded with strategies for telling the difference between different, different types of sources by judging, you know, what quality evidence might be and, and so on. Uh, and then I think we're going to be in a position for, for change. 
I think at the moment we're in a, a, a transitory state, like a limbo, where all of this stuff suddenly happened. And I, I don't know about you, but I cannot keep track of what's happening with all this information. All of this, this things happen, and we don't, as teachers, we don't know what to do about it. I agree 100%. There's just so much out there that you you can't help but lose track. Yeah. Uh, it just like slips away from you. Yeah. Um, and so again, uh, education is very important. It's important to integrate those uh, those sort of courses in the education of coaches and other, other sport organizations and in academia and everywhere where we teach people how to differentiate between good science and bad science. But um, aside from that, I want to ask you if you have any advice to to people listening on how to be able to differentiate between good science and pseudoscience even if it's just like simple and straightforward advice that, that can kind of like guide them yeah well um, yes i would say one this is this needs to be uh, taken with caution in light of what we said about marketing but if something is something seems too good to be true it probably is and one of the defining characters, characteristics of, of the pseudoscientific literature is excessive claims. Neurolinguistic programming even uses the word magic. These are magical things. So one, look out for over the top excessive claims. Secondly, is to do with the compatibility between what this thing is we're reading and the existing literature. It, it doesn't have to have reference to the literature to be a good article, but if it doesn't, then there are an alarm bell um, will ring. And if you read the, um, the websites or whatever for NLP or uh, brain gym or left brain, right brain coaching or something like that, uh, you'll find there are no references at all to any of the literature. Um, and therefore that raises concerns about how how connected is it to what we already already know? Third will be uh, testimonies. If somebody's offering an intervention and um, what they offer as evidence is other people telling you telling you how great it is, um, uh, that is worthless. Um, anyone that's developed a website or a book or anything like that knows you get your friends to write testimonies it's just one of those things that everyone does testimonies are not evidence even if they're genuine letters from people who benefited they're still not testimonies they're still not evidence because they're just views or perceptions um and uh, let's think fourthly I, or finally i would say um When people are, are, are talking about their ideas, do they do as we've said? Do they, are they clear about what would make this theory dead? Or is it all about positive, positive findings? In other words, do they put the emphasis on the positive or on the negative or on the positive or on the cautious? Einstein said, if this happens, my theory is dead. Um, I'll give you an example of the alternative. I was at a conference and some man had written a book about emotional intelligence. And I said, I don't know much about emotional intelligence. Um, is there, where is the evidence? And he said, I've sold 10,000 books. I said, no, but evidence, that is the evidence. That's, that's the kind of the vacuous testimonials, book sales, TV time, um, uh, that, that is used as evidence for serious scientific activities. Um, and um, I think just generally be cautious, you know, you know if, if people make claims, this, see, you know, one question you should ask should be true whether the guy you're talking to is a professor of sports science or some salesman, and that is, where is the evidence? Just where's the evidence? You know, Bill Gates has condosol because he's trying to impregnate our brains with COVID. All right, where's the evidence? Um, Self-determination theory um, proposes that three conditions are necessary for motivation. Where's the evidence? The difference is 
The second question, somebody can give me an answer. There are these studies, there are these publications. You can actually carry out the study yourself. How wonderful would that be? That's science. In, in one of your, and that's, that's incredible advice, I would say, uh, for sure. And in, in one of your um, talks, I found it on YouTube. Okay. You said that evidence these days is treated with the same weight as a very well-designed meme. And that's right, yeah. as someone yeah. who loves memes and mm -hmm. also enjoys science, um, yeah. just wondering if you can kind of elaborate on what you yeah. mean by that. Yeah, so memes... Um, the original, the inventor of the meme is actually Richard Dawkins, a biologist, and he said it's a cultural gene that just spreads. But it doesn't spread because it's true any more than a, a gene spreads because it's potent or whatever. It spreads because it's um, survivable, that's all. But there are some things that make it so that you might have come across um, David Wolf. They call him David Avocado Wolf because he made some silly comments about <laughs> avocados and he says that gravity is poison and he's complete loon. But the, the reason he were, he gets hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers is because he makes these punchy, strong statements. Uh, and people like it and they pick up on it. And, um, and the pseudoscientists are much better at the memes or mimetics than, um, than pro proper scientists. But I think there's another interpretation of meme that I've started to, to think about now, and that's just another, I used to call it successful, su success words. There are certain words and phrases that people feel disposed to agree with. Therefore, if you use them, people go, oh, I want to find out more about that. And scientists obviously generally are, are rubbish at this. Whereas if you say, uh, uh, there's a picture of a kitten, and this is one I actually did see, picture of a kitten, and then it was about COVID is a, is a lie. So the kitten is nothing, but people are, oh, kitten, lovely. They're very good at that. Um, and um, and the if you make these kind of bold statements. So the one I've been looking at recently is concept of physical literacy. And there is a, a relevance to Canada because Canada is one of the two centers of physical literacy uh, with the UK. Um, and uh, I've, I've published a big article um, in the Journal of Sport and Society, in which I called it a promiscuous concept. It's just used everywhere, everywhere um, in different ways. And we've just submitted an article for a systematic review of definitions. Um, the, the reason I think it, it's a meme is I'm not sure most people have the faintest clue what it is. I think it's a neat phrase. That's what it is. It's a phrase like, um, I'm trying to think something off of Facebook, but um, please share or whatever. But, oh, it's kind of engaging. Children, kittens, physical literacy. Um, so, for example, in Canada, you know, you've got the Canadian Sport for Life document that defines physical literacy as fundamental movement skills. Um, see, the philosopher in me thinks, why not just use fundamental movement skills then? I don't get, why would you have another name? And then the Canadian um, system also says it's basically the same as the British definition. No, it isn't. It isn't at all the same, at all at the same. They're talking about two different things. The British, one of the writers for the British definition specifically said the Canadian definition is wrong. So they're talking about, and then there's other definitions. But what they can be united behind is that meme, that phrase that's contagious. And that's the defining characteristic of mimetics is that it's contagious. Um, human beings are carriers of the contagion and they talk to people and they might inspire interest and then each of them becomes contagious. Um, and unless we as scientists can communicate in a similarly um, mimetic way, as we discussed before, uh, we're, we're struggling. And um, actually some people do do it. And uh, there are people that have this thing, infographs and all this type of thing, hugely popular that's definitely in the right direction. I can't, I, it's probably the best response that I've come across where a, a visual image summarizes um, a scientific paper. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, because we're competing against people 
uh, trying to sell us kittens and we'll never win if we don't do something similar. That's amazing. I think that universities need to do a much better job at, at teaching their, their, their scientists uh, mm. how to communicate that knowledge, how to create those, okay. um, those infographics, those videos, those um, memes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yep. it. We just need to be better uh, at it. And um, again, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate it. And um, no, just wondering uh, where can people find you? Uh, Twitter, social media, website, anything? Yeah. Um, well, I'm on Twitter. I'm Dr. D- Dr. Dick B. Uh, the best handle on Twitter, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. On, on Facebook, pound. the best route will be the coaching science group. Um, which is nice, you know, about 8,000 people now, different coaches, different topics. Um, and you can contact me through there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's probably the best way, I would say. 